Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar today. Uh, my name is Brent Stortz. Uh, I'm the Vice President of US and Canada for Wild Networks. Uh, a little bit of uh, bio for me, uh, spent 20 plus years in the oil and gas business in the energy sector with uh, seven different patents regarding uh, efficiency improvement, <clears throat> et cetera. Uh, joined Wild uh, about five months ago and uh, anchoring the, the US uh, sales and business development arm. Uh, joining us also today is Mr. Dick Rogers. Uh, Mr. Rogers is an entomologist with uh, Bayer. He has a bachelor's and master's degree in science and a, a few little tidbits there. He was born in the apple growing region of Nova Scotia, grew up surrounded by apple trees and honeybees, and has worked in and for agriculture his entire career. Uh, Dick has been keeping and studying honeybees since 1973, and has been a professional entomologist for 45 years. Uh, he received his bachelor of science from Acadia University in Nova Scotia, and his master's from McGill University in Montreal. Uh, Mr. Juan Becerra uh, is an energy engineer from the University of, I don't know how to say that, Juan, I, I apologize. Uh, I'm gonna butcher it. Uh, and was a former uh, Master of Science Energy Engineer candidate from Oregon Institute of Technology. Uh, he worked as a project leader for over three years at Takoon and Orion, uh, companies based in Columbia that designed and developed uh, Latin America's first IoT and Laura Wan uh, AMI metering infrastructure. He is currently the CEO of Apicola uh, Becerra. And also from Wild Networks, Mr. Gene Myers, who is a co-founder and C current CTO and has been uh, over 20 years, been working for over 20 years, uh, designing and building world-class teams and delivering award-winning software solutions with an emphasis on security, networks, and commerce. A little bit of an introduction to, to Wild Networks. We are on the, the NASDAQ. We were founded in, in 2016 um, with Laura Wan and, and WM uh, Business, line, Business Lineage uh, since 2013. Two companies combined with Origins in 2013. We are pre presenting a hybrid solution that will work at both uh, low Earth orbit satellites and uh, terrestrial networks. We do have 30 different launch partners uh, with across multiple market segments and uh, are very proud to have those guys along with us. A little on the, the design of our system in that we, we can, whether you have um, an urban area with a terrestrial network where you need to monitor uh, you know, your electrical infrastructure or asset tracking, soil moisture monitoring, oil and gas, whether it's a tank monitor or a pipeline, and then maritime as well. We, we can provide solutions to, to all of, of these uh, Use, use cases with our low Earth orbit uh, satellite. So we, we can cover the entire globe and uh, provide you with, with data. Some of the use cases that we've, we've been working on and, and developing, first and foremost, uh, we're here to talk about today is our beehive monitoring, uh, and also uh, soil moisture and monitoring, as well as navigation uh, buoys for either uh, maritime or on uh, towers and wind turbines, et cetera. Uh, many, many different use cases that we've, we've seen throughout uh, the industry. And basically, anywhere that you have a sensor that you need to, to bring back information, uh, we can either use our, our terminal setup, our collection device, or embed a, a module in that, that sensor itself and bring back data. As I mentioned a few moments ago, we do have our, um, our module that can be embedded in, in uh, different sensors as well as our concentrator or terminal, we can collect uh, via IoT uh, multiple different sensors and then relay that information back to, through the satellite, through the satellite system and uh, to our end users through our Fusion platform. It is important to note that we, we don't own uh, the satellites. We do have multiple partners uh, in the satellite arm or satellite industry that we work with and have a, a pool of data and services that we can offer. So our scope and, and reach is much greater uh, than previous. Our Fusion platform is the link between uh, the data and the satellite. So we can bring the data and get that to our end users, get it in a serviceable form, whether that's in a JSON um, or an MQTT uh, type packet to 
allow you the the ability to uh, process that information, whether you're using um, Ignition or some other different type of platform, Airtable. Uh, it, it gives you that that information in a usable format. When we sat down to do the presentation, one of the things that was asked is is what are the the end use cases and what do you see uh, for the U.S. and Canada in particular? And for me, whenever I look at at the situation currently uh, in the U.S., it doesn't affect Canada quite as much, but uh, over 60% of the U.S. is currently in some form or fashion of, of a drought. Uh, with 1,161 counties and 143 million people under drought disaster, they're being affected by uh, disastrous drought, as you can see in the map here. 42% uh, of the fresh water in the U.S. is, is used for uh, irrigation purposes. Uh, we want to be able to, to help use that resource uh, as I mentioned, you know, it's the most valuable resource that we have, and we will use that resource much more proactively and be a good steward uh, of that resource. And I cannot neglect that there are over 3 million uh, bee colonies in uh, between the U.S. and Canada. So in North America, 3 plus million bee colonies. It's a staggering number whenever uh, Dick and I talked about that. The secondly is, is from an energy standpoint. You know, currently with, with 2.5 million active wells, two plus million miles of pipeline. And this, this uh, image here shows the, the pipeline map uh, of oil and gas only, not of uh, salt water or, or fresh water. Uh, 180 million power poles and 75,000 wind turbines within North America. So being able to, to monitor tank levels, being able to monitor the, the wind turbine, pole tilt, et cetera, will allow us to be a good steward of the environment and make sure we're not starting fires with the power pole tilting, et cetera. And then lastly, uh, from a transportation and logistics standpoint, with 200 million container trips uh, being made every year, that's the display on the left. Uh, and then, you know, four and a half million semis, 250,000 miles of, of railway uh, between U.S. and Canada, a staggering number of goods and services are delivered uh, every day. And being able to monitor the, the temperature, the humidity, uh, et cetera, of those packages, of those containers being delivered to make sure that the product quality uh, is, is safe and that it's of, uh, you know, pristine quality. That's my time. And I'm going to be now handing it off to, to Mr. Rogers. Uh, one thing I would like to add is that uh, Dick did start with uh, Bayer in 2009 as a uh, principal scientist and entomologist in ectotoxicology and later uh, started and managed the Bee Health and Integrated Apiculture Research Program of the what was former the Bay, Bayer Bee Care Center. And with that, I will hand things over to Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Brent. Uh, good day, everyone. I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, I'm looking forward to discussing how Internet of Things uh, sensors and devices combined with satellite connectivity can acquire and deliver data from anywhere and be used to drive management decision-making for in apiculture. First, I would like to establish how important honeybees and beekeeping are to crop production. Honeybees are essential because they are, they are effective pollinators of insect pollinated crops globally. I like to say that pollen transfer or pollination is the spark that starts the crop production engine, but crop management, including protection, is the fuel that keeps it growing. In other words, honeybees are as, a, as vital to sustainable crop production as spark plugs are to automobiles. Honeybees face many challenges, however, um, but contrary to some opinions, honeybee species are not at risk of going extinct. However, the beekeepers running commercial beekeeping operations are facing serious challenges that threaten their business. And I've listed a few of the multi-factors uh, on this slide. Before we get into the details of our bee data via space project, uh, just imagine you are a honeybee. And then ask yourself, how does a honeybee make decisions related to colony health and productivity? Well, they're gathering data, of course, uh, through their various sensors like antennae and, and mouth parts and uh, feeling and, and chemical detection. Then imagine you are a beekeeper. How does a beekeeper make decisions about managing honeybee colonies, which are essentially livestock? Again, the answer is data. How does this beekeeper determine 
what the requirements are uh, in each of these 500 hives that he's standing in. Uh, this is a very difficult thing to do without data. It is clear monitoring and data are essential to inform beekeeping management decisions. Historically, inspections and management have relied on visual observations only and some form of record keeping if record, rec records were kept at all. Also, scheduling management by calendar dates was and still is a common practice. These traditional low-tech practices can work reasonably well for a few hives. However, they, they are inadequate for large commercial beekeeping operations because they lack efficiency and precision. Over thousands of years, beekeeping production has advanced from harvesting honey from feral colonies to managing colonies in primitive hives and then in modern hives. We have moved from medieval skeps meant to repel evil spirits to removable frame hives, such as the modern Langstroth system. However, we are now in an urgent need to move on from traditional methods and equipment to precision apiculture practices. The use of technology in apiculture is gaining ground very quickly in recent years, and this will deliver the big data needed to advance commercial apiculture to a higher level of practice and sustainability. In a nutshell, apitech uh, or apicultural technology uh, can help beekeepers improve and maintain colony well being, while also improving honey production and pollination services to achieve business success. In a recent LinkedIn article by Bernard Marr, he mentioned that in 2023, it's predicted that there will be more than 43 billion devices connected to the internet. That's more than five devices for every single person on earth. That's incredible. Many of the technologies have potential applications for apiculture. These technologies include things like smart devices, IoT sensors, connectivity from anywhere, and software for a whole variety of tasks. Bayer has partnered with WILD and a number of collaborators in the US, Canada, France, and Colombia to integrate several sources of data using new technologies. In bee research, there is a tendency to collect too much data, so we decided to keep things simple. We are initially focused on binary data from healthy colony checklist inspections and contact sensors, as well as simple gross weight data from hive scales. This flowchart shows the data sources along the top. These are hive scales, contact sensors, and visual inspections. For this project, each data source uploads to a separate cloud database. We are now working on a solution to aggregate all data into a single cloud database and possibly connect all data sources via satellite. You might be asking, how does observational inspection data get to a cloud database? Well, currently we are able to enter data on a healthy colony checklist inspection form, and then later transcribe it and upload it from a computer with internet connection. Or we also have the capability of entering the data in a field form, uh, a form app on iDevice, uh, and submit that directly to the, the Healthy Colony Checklist database via cellular or Wi-Fi. The hive scales used in this project can upload data via cellular from an, a manual download using near field communication or Bluetooth, or can upload automatically via Wi-Fi. The prototype contact sensor that was built for this project by WILD stores hive opening data and uploads automatically to a WILD cloud database or Fusion uh, via Wi-Fi. We will soon be converting to new contact sensors that use the LoRaWAN and hybrid terrestrial satellite connectivity. This upgrade will provide 100% global coverage. Contact sensor sensors can help a beekeeper track hive openings by field staff who are doing feedings, treatments, or other management tasks, and can also provide alerts to hive openings by vandals, thieves, animals, or weather events. I will show you another application of contact sensor data in a minute. Now, how and where will we aggregate the data from all sources? As I mentioned before, healthy colony checklist data gets uploaded to a database, specifically an Airtable collaborative relational database management system. This database is easy to use, powerful, 
affordable and has analytics and visualizations capabilities. Uh, but we are also investigating other analytics tools so we can evaluate them for this purpose. Okay, here's the other application of contact sensor data I want to show you in a bit more detail. Current hive scales do a great job of collecting lots of gross weight measurements over time. Plots of gross weight over time can reveal patterns and events. However, there's a lot of variability in the data and that can make it very difficult to interpret. If you had, for example, hundreds of hive scales deployed, it is very challenging to interpret charts for each and every scale. However, when hive cover removal data from contact sensors are combined with scale data, it's possible to automate simple mathematical calculations to determine net weight change, both from human interaction with the hive and uh, as a result of bee activity. So now we can plot two uh, weight change lines instead of one. Applying contact sensor data in this way can simplify scale data and provide points of reference for converting gross weights to net weight changes. Using net weight changes makes it easier to identify milestones and timings for management. So to wrap up, I'll say just like to say that Apotech, including satellite IoT, uh, changes everything and commercial apiculture will benefit. I also include here on this slide uh, a short list of tips for how to maximize the benefits from satellite and sensor technologies. And you can review these at your leisure. Thank you for your, inter your interest. And now I'll hand it over to uh, Juan Becerra, who's uh, in Colombia. Uh, Juan is a technology guru. Um, I'm very excited to have him join our project. And I'm looking forward to data flowing from Colombian hives uh, in the very near future. So over to you, Juan. Thank you, Dick. Uh, okay, so hello to you all guys. This is Juan Becerra from Colombia. Uh, I just got accepted into the HCC program, the Healthy Colony Checklist. And for me, it's an honor. I have been working with these kind of technologies for a couple of years now. And so I'm gonna tell, talk to you about my project. So just a little bit about me. Uh, as Brent told you, uh, in 2016, I was working in the development of LoRaWAN utility meters. 2019, I established Apicola Santa Ines, which is my beekeeping company. It started as a hobby and it has been, and it has grown a lot. Uh, in 2020, I had a, an interesting point in this beekeeping part of me, the COVID pandemic strike, and due to mobility restrictions in Colombia, I wasn't able to go and check on my hives. I lost about 30% of them. In 2021, I started using my knowledge in LoRaWAN technology, installing sensors in 15 hives, humidity, and temperature was being measured. And in 2022, uh, with my acceptance in the budget project, I have, I'm going to install a waste case. So something about Colombia, uh, as you can see, you can see the map of Bucaramanga. Bucaramanga is my city. And in the other end is Surata. Surata is the, the small town where I have my hive. If you put it in distance, we are talking about 20 miles, uh, 32 kilometers but it takes me around two to three hours to get there by car. Why? The conditions are not the best. And it's, it's time to start changing this kind of thing. So this is a little bit of the context we have here in Colombia. Some of the pros of Colombia and having been keeping in Colombia is that around 35% of Colombia's area is being protected by the government as natural reserves and, and an additional 11% are already considered natural national parks. Uh, it's a pro, we have been working with Africanized bees for over 30 years now here in Colombia. We have no winter, so we, we don't have wintering. We have only rain seasons that strike about two to three times a year. Uh, and this is the most important part of Colombia. Uh, the last census of 2021 showed that Colombia only had 150,000 hives installed. And that represents just 15% of the Colombia's national apiculture capacity. 
The other thing is that we have really cheap and accessible apiculture equipment. The average, the average price for a nucleus, but a complete plus a complete hive, it's around 80 US dollar. And doing some calculations, you can have a return over investment in 18 or less month or less month. Some of the cons we have, you have no infrastructure as you can, as, you, as you, I just told you. It takes me three hours to go uh, to a town that's 20 miles away. That's insane. Uh, we have lack of technical development in the agricultural area. Uh, all of our development is based on YouTube videos and having contact with international companies as the one I'm having right now. Another con, we have been working with Africanized bees. These bees are not gentle. You have to take lots of precaution. The hives have, have, have to be installed in remote areas. So that makes beekeeping a little bit difficult. Uh, there is no government controlling the honey imports. Colombia government is in controlling how much honey we are importing and the quality of that honey. And the most important, it's we have difficult access to new technologies, in part because um, the dollar issue, the price difference affects us a lot. So about my project and about Apicola Vicera and what I have been doing, uh, today I have 60 hives installed. I already have plans for for a new hype that will be installed in December 2022. I'm just uh, still waiting for the rainy season to to end. Uh, I produce three products: raw honey, pollen, and propolis. And currently, I have 15 hives that are being monitored with temperature and humidity. What I am using is a kitchen sensor, a temperature and humidity sensor. All the data is being collected by a beekeeper that works for me. He goes every two to three days to the APRs and collect the data via Bluetooth. And he sends it over me to, uh, to me over the internet. And here is like the part that changed everything for me as a beekeeper, the point of no return. Uh, this was due to COVID. Uh, as I told you, when COVID strike in Colombia, uh, the government closed all the roads. We weren't able to go outside the city in order to control the spread of the virus. So. I was 120 days away from my hive. I didn't have no one at the time that was going to help me control my apiary. So when I got back, when I finally got back to my apiary, I had lost 40% of the hives. Most of them due to ants, but some of them due to swarming. It was a, a huge blow for my company, but right now we managed to, to get it. In 2022, uh, we are having lots of issues with the rain season. La Nina phenomena has been striking Colombia since mid-May. Uh, rain season has extended for over five months now. Uh, we have had 50% increase in rainfall. And just in Surata, in the month of October, we had more water than from April to July. So it was insane. That caused some roadblocks. The road has been closed. 37 times since July, due to the river that the, go, the road goes through, it has increased its flow and the, we have no road at this day. So what's my plan for 2023? Uh, I'm going to install a new, so like a new type of sensors. These sensors are going to have gyroscopes with only one thing in mind. They're going to be installed in the lift uh it can help me like figure out when someone was opening my eyes and to have a better control on them uh, i'm going to have real-time alerts in these kinds of sensors they're going to work through uh through lora one technology i have already set up my gateway and uh, it's going to be expensive at the beginning because there is no internet access there so i have to, to hire a, a satellite company for internet but it's going to work uh, Next year, 100% of hives are going to be monitored and two new areas are going to be based. This is like my, my idea to get to 200 hives by 2023 and stop there and then like just focus in the commercialization of the honey. And the most important part, I'm working with a friend in a predictive response software. I have enough data that has been collected across the last years and they are like, we are starting to work on a program on an algorithm that's going to help me figure out when the hives are 
is struggling with temperature and humidity and what are like the corrections I have to take into account to help those hives prevail. Um, I think that will be all for, for me right now. So thank you guys. Uh, I will hand you over to Jim Myers. As uh, Brent told us, Jim is the co-founder and the CEO of Wild Technology. So I'm going to give you an informal talk about what it was like uh, working with Bear and, and bringing them in and, and how I got involved with the project um, earlier this summer. Uh, when I first joined this project earlier this summer, uh, we were at the point where the front end, uh, the, the team in Cambridge had been working with uh, designing the modem for, uh, for the system and, and the embedded software. And uh, at the point, though, at that point, we were having difficulties uh, with the satellite providers providing satellite connectivity. So rather than delay the project, uh, when I came in, uh, the decision was already made that we would start by uh, using terrestrial LoRaWAN um, to uh, to collect the data. And uh, that was a bit of a, a bit of a, a difficult thing. Uh, for me because we had been working to provide satellite connectivity first and foremost um, but we did a real line and actually integrated to terrestrial uh, uh, integrated in, and implemented terrestrial LoRaWAN within our fusion platform so I'll, I'll take a little bit of time here to to describe what the, the fusion platform and what ground link are um, so the fusion the fusion platform and the fusion uh, microservice infrastructure that it's built on is our data management platform for delivering the, the data from the sensors through to the satellites and ground stations and back to the to your application. Um, Groundlink is in fact the a managed service version of the of a front end built on top of the fusion network. If you're familiar with traditional LoRaWAN uh, kind of infrastructure you could very easily say that wild fusion is the network server whereas groundlink is the application server it's, it actually goes a little further than that as you might expect but but that's that's not a, a, a bad assessment at all what, what we're ideally trying to provide is connectivity as a service uh, from uh, from the modems um, over the sensors that we provide um, to the back to the data delivered to your application. It's a complete in, in ecosystem end to end from, uh, from what we say, some sensitive desktop. And if you if you were to look at GroundLink, um, it wouldn't un look uh, too unlike something like the Things Network does. And in fact, we are a more satellite focused version of what the Things Network are doing. But having said that, we also plan on having collaborative interfaces into the things that work as well. What we do, uh, what Fusion and, and GroundLink ultimately do for, uh, for Bear or, and, and anyone else using the platform um, is to deliver that data to an application where you can uh, manipulate that data any way you'd like. So just as, as Bear is using Airtables, you can specifically, uh, you can choose any platform that you'd like, and we have a number of different ways, which we'll go into later about how we do that. But we'll, for instance, um, Airtables is a simple HTTP interface using REST protocol. So uh, we set up the Bear project to send Dick um, that data to Airtables. One of the things, one of the unique things that we found out with with Bear, and one of, one of the things that we realized about the program that we were running, is that the data was going to change. We were going to add sensors. Uh, we, we were doing the contact sensor initially, um, and um, we were going to other, add other sensors to it. So the, the data was going to change not only from the data that we we're receiving, but the shape of the data that we wanted to also send uh, and forward through to Dick. And one of the realizations and one of the things that we started to build immediately for this was to be able to, to map data from one structure into another. Um, and I think uh, it became very clear that as this um, as this progresses, and I can see most any IoT uh, platform project progressing, is that that shape of that data will will change throughout the life cycle of the project, potentially. And so that is one of the, the one of the things that we worked on 
um, to help satisfy uh, this project initially in the beginning, we were really happy to. We've been receiving data from the sensors that we set up, that the initial batch that went out uh, since the 10th of August. And so we've received, we have received daily, uh, daily updates from the sensors that are simulating what would happen with the satellite at the moment. Um, and, and we've got received over 300 messages. So that's actually, that mechanism is working fairly well. Although we've had some issues around um, some, of the, some of the firmware around the, uh, the modems, it's all been a learning curve and we've resolved that and now it's going to be deployed shortly. So the, the system is, is working correctly. And again, now this brings us back to the satellite connectivity. Now that we have had successful communication with satellite, the satellites have been commissioned, uh, we've had successful tests, we're now at the point where we're going to be bringing satellite data. Uh, in the very first instance, we had planned before the end of the year, and it looks like it's going to be within weeks as now as we speak. So we're now back to uh, working primarily with, with Fusion on the satellite end of things. And again, um, the, it's our end-to-end -end capabilities that we believe are going to add, offer the most unique proposition for us. Um, the fact that we control the, the modems as well as the data on the other side. Um, so right now, as we in the application, as we're tracking the locations of the satellites as they pass over the you know the points where the where the sensors are, um, we see this very quickly changing as more satellites are added to the constellations as we're starting to form closer and more partnerships with with other satellite providers. The our tracking and prediction of satellite. Uh, satellite passes and then downlink data becomes more of a metric for quality of service and it's it's one of our uh, primary goals is to provide extremely good quality of service you know in this new uh, satellite medium combined with LoRaWAN to give us you know, kind of the best of both worlds one of the uh, one of the challenges and one of the things that we're beginning to work on now is how we can make advances in the provisioning process so if you have uh, hundreds or even thousands of satellite, or sorry, sensors, and with our modems embedded, um, you'll need to be able to not only provision those devices onto the system, but able to group those uh, sensors and manage them within groups and groups of data, and that that is going to be delivered. So you can very easily uh, provide very um, siloed sections of data. And so uh, one of the things that we're looking at are now right now, and one of the things that we're, is on our roadmap is providing uh, more, more fake functionality around the end-to-end -end provisioning. Uh, and going further on from end-to-end -end provisioning is the end-to-end -end security that you get now. Pretty much everything from uh, these days, from WhatsApp, you'll see end-to-end -end provisioning as an important feature. And, and of course it is with your data and the data that is going through the satellite infrastructure, um, that it is important uh, to have that kind of security. And uh, the system we have now is, but we're all now certainly does. And but we're looking at ways to actually improve that experience. Not only improving the security, but also improving the ease of use in in providing that security. As I described the uh, the Groundlink system as a managed service, uh, it also is going to be able to be provided as an enterprise solution uh, because of uh, because of the way that it was designed as a kind of a multi-tenant system with very granular access control and designed for organization an organizational hierarchy so the the system that we have now the first version that we have now of groundlink is the managed service and uh in with our evaluation kit we're going to be very soon um, allowing access and and uh, to those things. Brent can talk to more about that before before I get myself in a bit of trouble for going into areas that I shouldn't have. Uh, but uh, that's uh, those are the, that deployment that deployment flexibility is an important part of the design uh, to to the whole Groundlink system. And then finally, so uh, what we've been trying to do, and this is kind of a clever you know, uh, turn on on words. Plan words, but uh, the end-to-end -end value that we're adding, obviously, is because of our our unique capability 
um, controlling both ends of the spectrum, the data from the sensors through to the delivery of the data to your application. And, and really, that's what we're trying to do uh, securely and simply as possible. And so that, with that, that concludes my part of the presentation. And so back over to Brent. Thank you, Gene. Uh, at this point, we've got uh, a few questions that have popped up uh, from folks. And the first is for uh, Mr. Rogers. Uh, for Dick, uh, how will the data benefit all beekeepers? Well, thanks, Brent. That's a good question. When you're a single beekeeper and, and you're trying to control, for example, varroa mites, which is your number one problem these days, uh, you might do some experiments with the, your one hive and you might discover, you know, something works and something doesn't work. But if you bring your neighbors in and your, your, your bee club, for example, and everybody's doing uh, their little tests, then you combine that data and you can get maybe some greater value out of it. But just imagine if all beekeepers in the world were monitoring their hives, benefiting from their own data, but also providing it to a big data set in the, in the cloud, making it accessible to bee researchers, suddenly, your one little experiment becomes millions of experiments and that really increases the value uh, of the data and will benefit all beekeepers collectively so that's just one example of how that would work next question is for gene gene has has working with bayer inspired any particular innovation uh, yeah i touched on that briefly before um and and really i think the thing that came came to light and actually uh, it, uh, Dick just kind of reconfirmed is the the, the having a, a system where we can be very fluid with the structure of the data and present that in different ways. So uh, I think I think the the thing that I, I wasn't really looking at at first was is mapping the data and having being able to actually form it, transform it more than than we have. And it became apparent as as Dick wanted to add more and more sensors to the project and then wanted to look at that data in different ways that, that maybe we had to re really look at how how other LoRa providers had actually grouped that data. So we're, we're, we're actually making a system that is actually be flexible enough. So, you know, if, if Dick and, the, and his the teams wanted to, you know, experiment with data and the way that the, that data was being collected and what have you, that the, the, the platform allows us to give them a lot more further control about how that is delivered to those applications as well. The next question that I do have now is for is for Juan. Uh, Juan, what benefit uh, has or will wild satellite uh, technology provide you and, and your apiary? Okay, thanks for the question. Uh, as I told you, uh, communications and accessibility to my apiaries and hives is not the best. I have struggled a lot this year just trying to reach the apiary by car and I have like, I have the, the danger of losing my hives due to uh, control. So using wild technologies and their ELO technology of satellites will like increase the, the amount of data I'm going to be able to collect and depend less in my accessibility to the APRs. So I think it's it can be a game changer. Um, I work with these technologies in the metering sector in rural Colombia. It worked perfectly. And like seeing that companies such as Bajir and Wild and are interested in investing in these same, same technologies in the beekeeping industry, it can become a game changer, not only for me, but for all the beekeepers in Latin America that are having issues like accessing their, their hives due to weather and due to infrastructure deficits. Next question is actually for me, and it's uh, how can I order your products for testing? Uh, very simply, give me a call, uh, send me an email. We can get together and visit about your, your application and be happy to, to try to work with you to find the appropriate solution for whatever application that there may be. We can, we can work through that on, on if a concentrator or terminal is the right solution or, or a module. And a question that kind of follows up on that is, uh, what is the limit to the number of sensors that could be connected to a concentrator or terminal. Uh, the answer to that is there's probably in the five to six range, depending on the number of messages we're wanting to send and the, the volume of data, we're limited to uh, 50 bytes per message. Uh, so 
when we look at the the data size, I think that would probably be the the main precursor to that. Now we do also have the ability to do some some storing and forwarding as well. If it's if it's a small data set that we need to be sending, we can store multiple series of of time stamped data and send it up in in one message. You know, whatever that number of times is per day, uh, one to five to seven to twenty. Uh, that's depending on the application. The idea of end-to-end -end architectures and systems, sensors, gateways, satellite modems, et cetera, uh, con containers, cloudization, uh, can they be seen on the WILD website? Uh, Gene, is that uh, a question that you can answer? Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, what's on the website is, is a little bit old, but I think that it gives you a very good idea of, of how the, the system uh, was designed initially, but um, I think uh, it probably it will probably do for a refresh on the website at some point. But but uh, it does give a a pretty good overview of, of how what the architecture is there. Yes. Since yes, we sir. do have a few more minutes, uh, I'd like to just uh, give uh, my share my vision for apiculture in the future. Just to wrap it up, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So. Satellite uh, uh, technology is definitely in the future of uh, apiculture. And my vision is that most, if not all hives will be censored. So they will contain one or many sensors that will transfer data to uh, a cloud database, uh, hopefully like a data warehouse or a big data uh, cloud database. Uh, via satellite or some other means. And then analytics is very important. So data science will come into play to take that data and then automate the interpretation of it and explore it in ways that just human humans cannot do without uh, the power of computers. It should provide alerts and even um, hives will become somewhat robotic and even some tasks like feeding or treatments may be able to be automated uh, based on the data uh, provided. And overall, I would, I, I see apiculture really being a prosperous enterprise and really contributing to sustainable crop production, but it will take a lot of collaboration. So don't be afraid to, uh, join research projects or consult with researchers and participate in experiments and also cooperate with one another. So beekeepers do need to cooperate uh, to a high degree. And that should take us full circle from, you know, the current chaos of varroa mites and all the other disorders and stressors and bring us back to a new normal uh, practice for apiculture. And it'll all be data-based uh, as well as very collaborative. So thank you, and I hope that uh, summarizes my vision adequately. Yes, thank, thank you very much. We, we do have a couple of more questions that, uh, that got brought back in here. Gene, this is one, one for you. Uh, it said that at, at least each hour, one satellite will be available for uh, received sensor data. How is the synchronization made as the sensors most of the time need to be in uh, the save need to save energy entering into hibernation state. <laughs> okay, um, that's quite a technical question to to answer in the, in this kind of seminar. But there is there is quite a bit of deduplication that's being done on the back end. But it, it's it, it's a little too it's a little too a little too much to actually go into here. I believe. I know that the the first part of that is we do have a beaconing set up to wake our our module or um, terminal up to to be able to. Uh, send data. And as far as the the end device are concerned, I, I believe that's probably something that we can discuss at a later time, depending on the application and what it is. It, it is also we have different options depending on which provider as well. So uh, the next question is: Are your are your sensors capable to work with terrestrial LoRa WAN or LoRa satellite? And and I'll take that one if that's okay, guys. And that's uh, yeah, that, we that's are, good. Yeah, yeah, we're developing a a hybrid module that will be able to. To work with both, so whenever there's uh, terrestrial lower one available, uh, it will be able to access that. And then, if it is not available, 
then we'll use a satellite. So the hybrid nature of things um, we think is, is really gonna be a game changer uh, for us and for the industry. Well, guys, we're coming up on the hour. I wanna thank everybody for their, their time, uh, for, for joining us in this discussion and thank our speakers, uh, Mr. Rogers, uh, Mr. Becerra and, uh, and Mr. Myers. Uh, thank you all for, for joining us today. And if there's any additional questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to, to me at uh, brent.storts at wildnetworks.com. And I'll be very responsive to get answers to any and all your questions.